Welcome to another episode of London Lights. I am so pleased today to have on the program London, former London actor, John Capellis. He uh, was a Londoner who, who undoubtedly meets our definition of a London light. John was born in 1956 in London, Ontario, exactly four months before me. At, uh, in 1978, at the age of 22, he left London to hone his acting skills at the famous Second City venue, first in Toronto and then in Chicago. Of course, Second City Chicago is renowned for acting talent that it produced, including John. Uh, others include Bill Murray, John Candy, Tom Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, Mike Myers, Tina Fey, the list goes on and on. John, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, Second City, as I said, was a big starting point for you, and we'll hear about that in a moment. But uh, suffice it to say that you became a very busy working man in Hollywood. You appeared in numerous television shows and movies, including Roxanne with Steve Martin, Internal Affairs with Richard Gere, and three John Hughes movies, namely Sixteen Candles, Weird Science, and the quintessential high school teen movie, The Breakfast Club which many critics consider one of the best, if not the best, of high school teen movies. Some even consider it the best movie of the 1980s, and it's certainly a movie that's one of my favorites and a favorite of so many people that I talk to, and it's gone down in legendary history. Uh, your TV credits include working on Miami Vice, Forever Night, as Detective Don Shank, I think it was. Well, the CH is hard, skanky, like the, the joke oh. is always skank, skanky. Okay. Bottom line is some of the work you've done, the movie soundtrack of my life and so many other people, you got your start in London, Ontario. We are proud of you as Londoners, and I can't wait to hear more about your story. So why don't you start you. us off? Welcome to London Lights. And how did you start your gig with acting? Did you start in London, Ontario? Oh, indubitably. <laughs> Where else was there to start? Um, I think my parents would have said, um, that I was acting since I was born. You know, there was a little bit of that. Um, I have, had two older siblings, have two older siblings, um, and they're about seven, eight years older than me, and they're close in age. So they were kind of a tight unit. So when I came in, I had to sort of make my presence known to all the adults in my family. <laughs> I was uh, kind of the love child, as it were. Oh, yeah. And uh, from that moment on, I think... Um, very early point in my life, I always felt this sort of need to entertain a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I got my, I did a play at the Gallery Theater, which was Paul Haggis's theater on Rideout Street. Uh, was it on, right now, York Street? York Street. Um, and uh, that was the sort of first thing I did when I was in my early teens, and I did high school plays. But when I was in public school, and I went to the now formerly Ryerson Public School, um, I, um, I did this really silly World War I play about a guy who had putties, you know, and his putties wouldn't stay up. You know, putties are these things that, that you, people would, that, that soldiers would have up their legs. It was the silliest little play. But boy, when I got in front of that audience, I think I was in grade three or something, and I just, something clicked. And then I was in the school choir and a bunch of other stuff. Audiences were always a good thing to be around for me. Well, that's and, a cool uh, story. And then, and then in high school, I did Guys and Dolls at Central. And that kind of, that was fun to do, a high school musical. Because, you know, I got cast in the lead, boom. And uh, the year before, I was the curtain puller. So, I, you know, in the school newspaper, from curtain puller to star. And that was my, um, that was my uh, situation was kind of, I, I instantly sort of adored the notion of, of, of being on stage and doing that, that sort of work. I mean, it appealed to me. Then, you know, um, as as it would, you know, as people would do, they said, oh, no, well, you're not going to do that. You know, you've got to you know, turn around and do something serious. You're not going to go to law school or this and that. So it was it was discounted after a little while. Excuse me. I'm just it's so hot here in California. <laughs> <laughs> I rub it in. <laughs> it's like just barely um, above freezing here. Yeah. But the thing is that. I just, uh, I gravitated towards it, I think is what you could probably say, you know, yeah. more than anything. But th the thing also about London, and, you know, we were, uh, I was raised in North London, but we were not, um, 
to the Manor Born family. So those those families around us, you know, like Victor Garber, who grew up down the street and who's a little bit older. Oh, telephone. I'm sure you oh. have a number of agents that will grab. I was that. hoping this wasn't going to happen. Tell Spielberg I'll call him back. <laughs> I don't know the thing about Victor Bar Garber and all those people. They all went to the London Little Theater, and they yeah. all had that sort of stuff. And my parents were not, you know, in that crowd, and they really didn't feel secure about sending me to something like that. Well, so, hey, people are going to be very interested in what high school you went to. Where did you go? I went to Central, LCCI, London Central Secondary School on uh, Waterloo. Now, I know we're going to get to the Breakfast Club later, and I know you played a custodian in that movie, Carl the Janitor, mm -hmm. and I think you were inspired by one of the janitors or custodians at Central. Is that right? There was a guy uh, really kind of, uh, I never knew his name, and I think it was at Central for five years. Tall, silent type guy with a little uh, sort of little mustache. And he always had this sort of knowing thing about him. And, you know, we never really wanted, hey, you know, Joe or whatever his name might have been. There was kind of a formality about it. And the janitors were, they were much older, right? These yeah. guys were probably my dad's generation, World War II vets. Um, so it wasn't like we were chummy with them. Whereas, yeah. but there was a, collegiality and also um they had this knowingness about them and you combine that with my father had a clothing store in the market building and he always said you know doesn't matter whether the mayor of the city comes in or a factory worker from mccormick's or whatever you treat everybody the same so that was my whole thing with carl was that he had dignity yep and and i, I got that, that i got that from the janitors at my school they they didn't take any guff from us yeah. And like, you know, they were, they were well-trained individuals yeah. and, um, you know, there, there was never any, there was never any, you know, uh, you know, U.S. style violence in our school. Like, you know, occasionally somebody might get into a fight over a hockey game or something <laughs> on TV, but, you know. A well, I, John, I love that. I love that stuff. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed about speaking to you to prepare for this interview was your memories of London, because we were both born in 1956. And you said, as you were talking to me, you said, you know what, I'm thinking of that smell I used to get from McCormick's or Opeechee's uh, gum factory. At well, the there, there are Adelaide lots of, the, 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 the smells I remember, we were going up uh, Richmond Street over the bridge down to South London, past Carfrey Crescent and, you know, past Labatt's in the summer and just the smell of the, the hops and the beer and or whatever that was. And, uh, you know, the Opeechee Gum Factory, which was at the corner of um, Adelaide and, and Dundas. Yeah. Uh, Kitty Corner, for, you know, where the police station is now. But that used to be a casket factory on one side and the Opeechee Gum <laughs> Factory where they made, you know, uh, Double Bubble, was it? Or, um, no, no, Bazooka. Bazooka is what they Bazooka gum, yeah. Double right. Bubble was, was Fleer. But, uh, hey, and we also talked about, you know, some great seminal events that happened in London, like cable TV. Now we can get TV. all these scandals. We didn't mention slip, Slippery the Seal. But, yeah. Um, yeah, there and was... Riding the, our bikes. Well, cable TV was a big thing in my... In everybody's world because, first of all, like, my folks didn't, you know, pull the trigger on that one until well I was after I'd left home, actually. Uh -oh. So we didn't have the advantage of it. So I'd go over to friends' places and watch cable. Yeah. You know, and, and the cool thing like was like when people would talk about having seen Johnny Carson, which meant you were either had cable and you stayed up late. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. But I guess cable TV was founded in London by the, you know, first families that sort of piped it in from Detroit, then Cleveland, right? Yeah, that's so, right. I hope to do a show on that. Hey, we're coming up to a break shortly, but I want to just have you transition us from London into Second City. How did all that come about? That's a big step. Well, I, um, I, I, I finished Central in 74, and I went off to university to Carleton. And I, I, I know now uh, from my sort of ripe old age that I probably should have taken a year off, which is what people were starting to do, kids were starting to do. My parents were, you know, taking a year off kind of was like, you're going to jump across this crevice, and maybe you're going to fall in and never go back to school again. So there was always that possibility. And I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to go to school again, but everybody was, you know, that, that was the trajectory. So what I decided to do was go to school. But um, my, after three years at Carleton, and I really enjoyed Carleton in a lot of ways, uh, 
and I met a lot of great people and I worked in the radio station. I was a first FM student FM station in Canada, CKCU FM. There were a lot of great things, but I just wasn't inspired. And I remember sitting in the uh, um, college English class, third year, uh, uh, you know, with a bunch of other people wearing tweed jackets thinking, you know, I don't want to become an English professor. And so I got involved with a few plays there. And again, it, it, my, my uh, spirit was sort of reinvigorated by that. And at the, at the end of three years at Carleton, I, I, I decided not to go back. And um, instead, I went to work on an oil rig in Alberta. Wow. Uh, worked for Mobile Oil, which was a horrendous experience. <laughs> One that I don't recommend. At least, you know, I thought I could uh, handle it. But that's another chapter when you read my book. Okay. Um, and then, and then um, through a sort of circuitous series of events, found myself back in Toronto after having had sort of a I had a little bit of a fracture with my folks when I when I left university and then came back and I made this admission to my dad. I said, I want to be an actor. And he sort of looked at me and said, okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you want to try it out, do it for a year, but get a job acting. Don't get a job waiting or bartending or something. Get a job acting. And um, if it doesn't work out in a year, and a year and a half, you don't get a job, then, you know, we'll consider going back to school. I thought that was a great proposition. Yeah. And so the, it lit a fire under me and I was in Toronto and it was the, um, it was the spring of 1978. And I discovered Second City one night walking past the fire hall in Toronto. I heard this laughter and I had heard of, I, had, I was about to take a Second City workshop when I was in Ottawa and it didn't work out. The touring company was there before. So I went, oh, and I went inside and they were doing the improvisational set. And lo and behold, people were on the stage. They were talk, doing the, their own words. People were laughing, and they were getting paid. Wow. Right? And I saw in the back, there's this guy, roly-poly, bigger fellow, and it ended up being John Candy. He was watching the improv set, and there was wow. Martin Short. It was on the stage. And I, I couldn't stay away from Second City. I went back every night from that moment on. And within a month and a half, I started taking workshops, and uh, within three months, uh, I was an extra on SCTV. And then I had this moment where I met the producer, Bernie Sollins, who came up from Chicago. And uh, I walked up to him and I was dressed in, as an Arab with his staff uh, because they were doing the Bob Hope Open Desert Golf Classic that's on SCTV. I was an extra. Yeah. And I walked up to him and I said, I'd like to audition for Second City Chicago. All the other extras were mortified. Everybody was mortified that I had the audacity to go up to talk to the producer at Second City. Good for you. And another side thing was that I said to my mom uh, earlier that year when I came back and sort of had this discussion with my dad, I maybe want to get my American citizenship because my mother was an American. Hmm. So we sent away the papers for that. Long story short, I, um, I uh, told my father I had an audition for Second City in Chicago, which I didn't. And I took a Greyhound bus and borrowed his credit card, to, to took a Greyhound bus from London to Chicago, stayed at a theatrical hotel, showed up at Second City, surprised the hell out of them. But they afforded me an audition. And on August 4th, 1978, I got a gig at Second City in Chicago. Wow, fantastic. And I phoned hey. my mom in London. I said, Mom, I got, I, got this, I got this job. And she goes, really? I thought they already offered it to you because I sort of said oh, that yeah. they offered it to me. And I said, well, no, I had to audition for it. <laughs> at which point she said you know there's this package here from the u.s consulate should i open it i said yeah and it was my passport oh wow uh, american passport john i gotta stop you there we have to take a quick commercial break we got lots to talk about viewers stay with us we'll be right back with john capellas legendary london actor and we'll talk about his involvement with the breakfast club movie and some other shows talk to you soon Welcome back, viewers, to London Lights. We're here with the great actor, John Capellas of London, Ontario. Now, before we went to the break, John, we were talking about uh, your parents and you're now making this move to Chicago. You're pursuing acting with Second City. 
Was it hard for your parents to wrap their heads around the idea that their son from London, Ontario, could actually make the big time in Hollywood? Were they struggling with that? Uh, you know, I, I, unfortunately, my father passed away before I went into, I got into the movies. He died in 1980. So he only saw me on stage for a couple of years and he came to Chicago. And I actually think that he was really pleased with the fact that I was doing what I was doing. Um, there, was, there was an element in my parents, there was fear, but also you see my parents came from elsewhere. So they weren't born and raised in London per se. My father came from Greece when he was 12 to London, almost a hundred years ago now. And my mother was born and raised in Boston of Greek family. So we had sort of this, there was an ambition in, in both my family. So th th there wasn't that. I think the fear of going to Hollywood was probably, you know, in sort of everybody's mind was a little bit awesome and, and, and daunting. But, you well, know, you don't think of the end game when you're young. You just <laughs> plow ahead. That's right. But what a tribute to your parents that they're, they're standing behind you during all of this. Because they very easily could have said, look, we need you back here. There's a job at London Northern Telecom. Uh, why don't you come back and take that job and stay home with us? It wasn't in their nature to do that. I don't think yeah, it wasn't in my father's nature, I think, was, you know, they, they both had, I wouldn't say wandering spirits, but they, they both understood the, the, the urge to need to, to, to do your own thing. Yeah. You're in Chicago. You're uh, with Second City. Did you meet John Hughes, the great director of movies, producer of movies that we'll talk about in a moment? Was that in Chicago or after you left Chicago? No, it was in Chicago, and it was 1981-ish, uh, just before he uh, made uh, 16 Candles, and I met him through the casting director, Jackie Tucker. It's a great meeting. Really? Well, let me just introduce John Hughes for a moment. Just bear with me one second while I read this. John Hughes was an American filmmaker, started with National Lampoon, went on to write and produce, and sometimes direct some of the most successful live-action comedy films of the 1980s and 90s, such as National Lampoon Vacation, sequel European Vacation, Christmas Vacation, Mr. Mom, 16 Candles, Weird Science, The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Pretty in Pink, Some Kind of Wonderful, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, She's Having a Baby, Uncle Buck, Dutch, Dennis the Menace, Beethoven, Home Alone, 1, 2, and 3. Where, yeah. What can you say about John Hughes, an incredible tour de force to be reckoned with, and the stars align, and John Capellis and John Hughes meet. What was yeah, that? You know, and funny thing is, he was from suburban Detroit, and, and like, I think you can relate to this. There were just lots of things we had in common, you know, from yeah. Fireball XL5 to, you know, oh. uh, from music to cultural things to sort of be the zeitgeist of be, having been born around the same time. Right. And we hit it off. Yeah. And well, um, I think it was a great, great association for me, obviously. It was like, because I just wanted to be in the movies. Yeah. And you know, in London, on Channel 10, when I was a kid growing up, there was the afternoon movie. Yeah. And uh, I, I just always wanted to stay home and watch that. So now I was living it. Well, I could just imagine. I mean, they got to do a movie about this. You meeting John Hughes. But I want to talk about The Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club, what can you say about that movie? Everyone I talked to has seen it. Everyone has been touched by it. Everyone has changed their thinking about something or other as a result of that movie. And you were in that movie. And certainly it wasn't a major part, like the part that the Brat Pack played. Michael Anthony Hall as the brain, Molly Ringwald as the princess, Amelia Estevez mm -hmm. as the jock, Judd Nelson as the criminal stoner, and Ali Shady as the basket case. And there's two adults in that film. There's the teacher, Vern, and Carl the janitor. And I love what you said during some of the extras I was looking at when I'm watching my edition of The Breakfast Club. And you said, look, there's no small parts. There's only small actors. Well, that's, the, that's, a, that's a, a time and memorial line. That's not my line. That's from history. But it's true. It is true. And, and that's what I love about this movie. It's almost a perfect movie uh, from the beginning to the end with that great song by Simple Minds uh, that we all know and love. But your part might have been small, small, but you tackled it and did a fantastic job. The, the uh, expressions on your face, to the words, to you confronting Vern, uh, it's just a classic. And it, 
it must make you so proud to be a part of a movie that was considered one of the best, if not the best movie out of the 1980s, that entire decade. Yeah, I am. And, and when, I, when you think about it, when I think about it, the process of making it into the final film was pretty difficult because you said there were two adult actors. Well, there were more actually in the original script, mm -hmm. but it ended up that there were, you know, uh, Gleason and myself. Um, the film was, uh, I think, really um, put together by Dee Dee Allen, the editor, exquisitely. And I think that she is the unsung hero in making him this movie because John had an incredibly big film, a lot of elements to it. And then it eventually sort of became the film it is through the editing. And I think he learned a lot from that movie. That's why he had all that list of films afterwards, because I think The Breakfast Club was truly a learning experience for him. It's a great movie because, uh, uh, because there was so much attention paid to the detail. Yeah. And it was the first time I'm reading a book, forgive me for admitting this, called Brat by... Uh, Andrew McCarthy, but I'm actually... Uh, well, really I hear it's good. It. I hear it's really, really good. It's a good book. But he talks about John Hughes and how uh, so many mu movies up to that time had kind of looked at teenagers as a caricature. That's right. This was one of the first movies that actually had respect for the teenagers' struggles and their, uh, their sense of genuine dignity, which he showed on screen. Precisely. And he didn't talk down to teens. No, that's right. And your part was so good in that way because... Here's Vern, he's kind of the teacher who's watching over these delinquents, and he's kind of jaded as a teacher. And you said, look, in fact, I'm going to quote what you said to him. Come on, Vern, the kids haven't changed. You have. You took a teaching position because you thought it would be fun, right? Thought you could have the summer vacations off, and then you found out it was actually work, and that really bummed you out. So well done. I and love shooting that place. scene. That was a fun scene to shoot. I mean, yeah. the whole thing was uh, challenging. And yeah, at that point in my career, it was scintillating to work on that. Totally. And I, and I love the part where you come into the library where all the kids are having the detention. And, uh, yeah, and that, you know, and they're, you know, he's Bender, of course, is kind of mocking you and you put him in his place so quickly. You know, just that look on your face and you say, man, don't think I haven't been seeing what's going on here. Well, that's the sort of throwback to London, too, because a lot of the kids at Central, as much as I enjoyed and loved growing up, uh, a lot of North London kids were pretty uh, snotty and, and had big attitudes. And, and some of these janitors just, you know, you know, they, they, you know, they were from a different part of town and uh, or different and they had seen different things. And I think that um, I think that that trans transferred a bit in the Breakfast Club because you know, despite the fact I'm Bender, but they're all middle class kids in the Breakfast Club. You know, talking about their middle class problems, and you know, I, I think that um, Carl had had seen something. Something happened to Carl. Yeah, you know, that is so cool how you brought that back to London and your experiences in London. I can tell you that I, as a Londoner, just I, I adore that, and I'm sure that people that see this program are going to be just tickled to hear that. Well, and also, having grown up in my dad's clothing store and seeing people from all walks of life, and I go back to the dignity issue. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think about my dad's store a lot because um, I saw everybody, all different types of people, in all different phases of life. And, and um, you know, there's an element of just treating people with a sense of that uh, equality that I think is, I'm afraid, uh, it's a quality that's missing. Yeah, um, that's being diminished, you know, with a lot of uh, the way people sort of deal with one another nowadays in terms of there's a lot of hostility. Yeah. And um, I think we could do without that, but that's very, very well uh, said. Off um, my high horse. Yeah. Hey, are you actually writing a book right now? Uh, was that true? Well, I always write. Um, uh, I, I've got a couple of uh, projects right now that I'm writing and producing, and one of them is about. Um, the slave Onesimus who discovered uh, uh, the inoculation for smallpox. And, mm. and another one is called The Visiting Professor, which is a, a comedy. So I'm writing, always writing and doing stuff. I mean, Second City uh, ignited the, uh, the writing switch in me. Very and then cool. it goes back to being in Toronto in, in 78. It's like, wow, you can say your own words. You can go up there. So, 
you know, my whole Second City experience for the eight years of when I was in Chicago, that, that really made me as an actor. And I think I might have mentioned this to you when we were talking earlier of, uh, off screen, but I'm sort of known as a Chicago actor, and I'm proud of that. Because, you know, I worked with Gary. I mean, the, the guys that were in my year at, in Second City, when I started Gary Sinise and, and, and Joe Mantegna and John Malkovich, people like that were all working in the theater in Chicago at that time. We were sort of starting at the same time. And there was John, a sense of, sense of momentum about that, which was really, really cool. We're almost out of time. Uh, John, I, it's been a pleasure having you. Well, on, let's do a part that, two. <laughs> uh, I'm down for that. London Light, for sure, and a great inspiration. Any final words for the young, struggling actors in London that want to follow in your footsteps? Well, there are a lot of paths. You know, London, you know, with, with Dorothy Downs and the London Film Festival, there are, you know, there are lots of places to show your work. There, you know, you have the tools to make films and to do things. You know, if I was growing up in London now, I'd be pretty, pretty, pretty gassed about what I could do and the, the opportunities. So don't let people define your vision. Make your vision yourself. Hey, great final words. Thanks for being on London Lights. Well, it's thanks for having a, me. Such a pleasure even speaking to you as we prepared for the show. And I hope we can continue this. Uh, maybe do a project together someday. But, we uh, shall and will. We can always, for, always keep the door open. Yeah, thanks work. for being on the, thank you. Thank you for being on the program. And you take care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you.